Okay, everybody, so here I is. I'm on the uh, beautiful I-10. I say that very facetiously. It's uh, actually quite hideous, and I'm somewhere between Los Angeles and uh, the, uh, the Miami of the West without any of the culture known as Phoenix, uh, which is uh, also a shithole. No offense to anybody that has the misfortune to live there. As you can see, uh, at some point, this will all be one continuous uh, metropolitan area, much like the East Coast, but, uh, you know, at an annual uh, summertime temperature of about 105 degrees Fahrenheit with 0% uh, humidity. It's, it's all going to be developed here. Uh, it's not a very bright future. You could see uh, most of the people here would not be able to survive here without the benefits of uh, air conditioning and automobiles. How's that for self-sufficiency, huh? Uh, due to the intense uh, dependence on the automobile, uh, most people I, I tend to see, I'd say at least 60% of them are uh, uh, overweight, if not grotesquely overweight. But let's take a minute and look at some of the plants going on here. There's an iconic uh, Mojave Desert plant. This is uh, Loria tridentata, also known as the creosote bush. Now, Loria is in the Zygophilaceae, and it's got a few species down there in South America, too. Uh, also in the Zeric areas in the deserts. You can see the fruits right here. Those little fuzzy, little fuzzy bastards. Now, it's extremely hot right here, so I don't even know how long I'm going to last. But uh, this, this plant, uh, these are, of course, uh, clonal. They can form colonies. They can live for upwards of 10,000 years in some cases. Uh, but, again, that's all the below-ground tissue. It's not the actual above-ground tissue, and it is all just clonal. So it's not really the longest-living tree, or, or plant, rather. That, would, that title will go to a Pinus longeva. Uh, the great basin bristle compine uh, individuals, of course, which can live upwards of uh, 5,000 years, maybe a little bit under that. As you can see, it's so hot that there are very few perennials. There are almost no perennial forbs except for uh, Encelia ferinosa, which I don't even know if I can find a living one. Uh, now, it's found in Encelia ferinosa, actually. Oh, there's one looking like complete shit because it's so hot. Look at this. This used to be a lupin. Uh, it's an, uh, it seems to be a annual, I don't know if that's, a, I don't know what species this is, if it comes back from a rootstock. I'm going to go ahead and say no, it does not come back from a, a rootstock. It seems to be an annual. Now the annual habit, of course, is an adaptation to very hot and dry areas where it doesn't make sense to invest all that energy in building a woody tissue. You know, it's much easier to just grow really, to germinate, grow really fast, flower, and fruit all within a span of three or four months and then just disperse a large amount of seed. But let's look at that Encelia farinosa. You go wonderful member of the uh, sunflower family. This can take a beating like no other. Oh, this is actually still alive. I don't know how, but uh, it's still alive. Now, uh, you could see, actually, that looks pretty dead, but it'll come back from that, uh, from this woody tissue down there. The interesting thing about this uh, just notable is that it exudes a sap which smells absolutely uh, delightful. Uh, let me see if I can get some. In fact, I, I believe one of the common names for this was uh, in uh, Inciencio, however the fuck you say that in uh, Spanish. See, there you go. There's a little bit of that sap that's uh, exuded on the bottom of the uh, of the uh, shoots right there, right close to the ground. Uh, and it smells, like I said, it smells absolutely delightful. It does kind of smell like incense uh, for anybody who is traumatized by a Catholic upbringing such as myself. Okay, so again, this is Encelia farinosa. There's about 20 species in the genus Encelia. Probably, I don't know, six or seven in California. Encelia actonii is another species that looks a lot like uh, this one, farinosa, except actonii only has one capitula per, per uh, peduncle. See this? See that's how this one has like three flower heads? Four actually per flowering shoot. And C. actonii only has one. You know, as does Ravenii too, which is a white flowered, uh, a white ray flowered in C. a very beautiful, extremely rare too. Uh, so, and then in C. a frutescens is another California species and it does not have any ray flowers. You know, these, uh, when you see them coming up, they'll be on either side of I-10 over there and you know, just it's it's amazing. It's just these they call them brittle bushes because the the shoots break pretty easily. And this is still alive, believe it or not. Just very dry, uh, amazing ability to go go uh, basically uh, almost dormant. 
you know, just, I'm not sure if it's the ceasing photosynthetic activity or what, but you will see these and it's just lines of yellow flowers for miles in the spring when they're going off. But interesting thing about this plant, okay, is see how uh, pubescent, i.e. just covered in tiny little hairs, the leaf is. Uh, researchers found, of course, that what that those leaf hairs do, and that's on both the adaxial, the upper and the uh, lower, the abaxial surface, what those leaf hairs do is basically reduce the uh, temperature of the leaf. They help reduce the temperature of the leaf because above, uh, you know, above a certain temperature, probably about above 85 to 90 degrees, photosynthetic activity declines precipitously. You know, it just kind of turns off. It gets, and a lot of plants do that. It just gets too hot. You know, you go to the smoke tree, uh, soil thamnus, uh, uh, Sorothamnus spinosus over there in Fabaceae, it, it turns out that species uh, photosynthesizes best at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, but most plants don't do that. Most plants above a certain heat temperature just stop photosynthesizing, even a lot of the cacti. If it's too hot, they just shut down. So what this pubescence does is it reduces that leaf temperature, uh, you know, so the air, it reduces the leaf temperature well below uh, the air temperature. So it could be 105 degrees out here. Meanwhile, the actual temperature of the leaf is at an optimal, you know, 80 degrees, you know, which is about the most efficient uh, temperature uh, for, uh, well, it's the, it's the best temperature for uh, photosynthetic uh, efficiency. It's very, uh, very wonderful adaptation. And you see that in a lot of plants, that same pubescence, you know, that same, those, basically a bunch of little tiny hairs just covering the surface of that leaf and reducing uh, you know, uh, the, the leaf temperature, reducing, reflecting most of that sunlight, keeping those leaves cool so they can keep photosynthesizing, even though it's uh, generally hot as balls outside. So again, as you can see, almost everything uh, has lost its leaves, except uh, for this Parkinsonia florida, which uh, you'll know, of course, uh, from that pinnate leaf structure right there, you know, that uh, pinnate just means, you know, basically a uh, on either side of that central shoot, that central rachis, you know, which is, you know, again, not a solid apomorphy, but a, uh, it's almost an almost very reliable, uh, not 100%, but very close, uh, reliable trademark of the pea family, that the pinnate leaf structure right there, you know, on either side of that central rachis, uh, it's basically this is this is opposite. You can see the the leaflets are opposite pinnate. But anyway, this is a you know. Iconic desert shrub on a Mojave in a Sonoran desert, Parkinsonia, Florida, uh, Palo Verde. It's just, I think, the, I think blue Palo Verde, not sure, uh, don't really care, but you can see it's, it's got, the, the important thing about this is it's got the ability to photosynthesize through its stems. So, you know, this is an alive branch. This branch is still alive. It's photosynthesizing through the, set, through the stem, through the shoots right there, and it's got just, you know, I mean, I guess it's here it's got very rudimentary leaves. You could see those right there. And then this branch, who knows why, same tree, but this branch decided, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna send out, I'm gonna take the uh, energy that it that it uh, costs, the carbohydrates that it costs to send out some leaves and, uh, you know, uh, see uh, see how I see how I fare, you know? So I guess he, he figured he could get a good return on his investment by pumping that leaf tissue out. And again, this thing is probably, the roots on this, I mean, they must go down 40 to 50 feet at least, probably more than it. You know, uh, I don't know if they go down deep enough for the water table, but they certainly go down deep enough to get uh, a little bit of moisture and at least cooler temperatures. Here's the fruits you can see. Obvious giveaway, it's the legume. See those little pea pod looking things? And then the interesting thing about this, well, this flower is not even going off yet, or it's done going off rather, but it's it's in that Sace alpinoid subfamily. You know, so it's got those five petals, uh, not quite uh, radially symmetrical, but almost radially symmetrical. You got to look up the Sace alpinoid subfamily. Very interesting thing going on. And then again, in that same uh, Sace alpinoid subfamily, at least I believe, is this bastard, which is very interesting. This is a genus called Hoffman Segia. Again, he's in that Sace alpinoid subfamily, but a pea family. And here's a tiny little flower, if you could see it. You know, you can kind of get what's going on there. Not your typical. Uh, uh, you know, pea flower. I mean, it's a say salponoid subfamily, but it doesn't look like the typical, uh, the typical flower of say, you know, lupinus or uh, you know, a lathyrus or astragalus or anything like that. Much different flower structure, but it is Fabaceae 
it's just the safe salponoid subfamily you can see the petals drastically uh not drastically but much much longer than the corolla those stamens right there this goddamn thing doesn't want to focus and it's going to give me an aneurysm okay and same thing's going on you can see there's green in those stems it's photosynthesizing uh when it does have leaves they're pinnate same thing pinnate leaf structure and uh, let's see if it's got fruit no not really it doesn't have oh it's got some little tiny fruits maybe maybe they already opened up right there hoffman zechia is a pretty uh interesting genus i guess it's I guess there's some species in South Africa, and then there's some in the Zurich areas, of course, obviously, of, uh, of North America. I've seen Hoffman Segia repens in Utah. I've seen a very rare one, a Hoffman Segia peninsularis, uh, which is uh, endemic to Baja, on the east side of northern Baja, California, closer to the Sea of Cortez. Um, but it's very odd that... Uh, you know, I almost wonder if it's two different genera, if, that, if the genus needs to be split up, because it's very odd to have species in Africa in the same genus, uh, you know, as you got species in North America. It's just, it's such a, it just, you know, that Atlantic Ocean is such a barrier, you know, such an isolating barrier to speciation. You know, you wonder how, how long ago where did, you know, did that dispersal event happen? And did it happen from uh, North America to South Africa or vice versa? Uh, was it just uh, I'm guessing birds you know maybe who knows but uh, if, if it's if there were a re if the reason that you got two different populations on two different continents is because the Atlantic Ocean opened up the Atlantic Ocean's been there at least I believe 80 million years you know so uh, it's very unlikely that uh, they're that closely related the the Hoffman Segia species on either continent you know so someone maybe someone's doing work on it maybe they're gonna split it up and that's happened with a bunch of taxa is you know that happened with uh let's say you know in the uh the orobankaceae there was a genus called orobanki a para parasitic plant and there, there was a orobanki in north america and then there was an orobanki in europe and they just split them up they said you know what they look a lot alike but we, we looked at the molecular uh, phylogenetics we looked at the dna and it turns out that the orobanki in north america uh, is is uh, different enough molecularly from the ones in Europe to warrant it being in a new genus, and that genus is now Aphelon. Anyway, it's had its balls over here, and uh, you know, I just uh, don't know what else I can really show you. I'm sweating my ass off. I left the car, the truck on so that the dogs can go in there. I just really want to express to you that it is like an oven here. You know, you stick your head out the window, and it basically feels like, uh, it feels like someone's got a blow dryer on your, on your head, you know? So, ooh, what is this? Is that Pusophyllum shadii? That is called Schatz pygmy cedar, and it's not actually a cedar, it's a member of the Asteraceae, uh, <clears throat> the Aster family. If I could just hop over this goddamn thing. It's a monotypic genus in the Asteraceae, in the sunflower family. And a lot of species in the sunflower family are perfectly adapted, okay, to this dry uh, desert heat. You could see that. See, it look the foliage looks kind of like a like a juniper or something. These are these are absolutely beautiful when they're blooming too. <clears throat> I got I got some real nice full frontal shots of this. So it looks like a like a juniper, but then of course you get up there and it's got the tip. You can see that white stuff. That's the pappus of the Achenes. Remember, pappus is a word you use. It's a safe word in the Asteraceae dungeon, the sunflower family dungeon. Look at the Achenes right there. Just basically little dandelion seeds, which with uh, that uh, which thought to be a modified calyx, you know, supposedly the sepals, aka the pappus. You know, remember that pappus. You ever get stuck in a in an Asteraceae dungeon? You know, you're a little worried. You got the ball gag in your mouth. You're getting whipped. You know, and uh, you use that word pappus, and hopefully they'll go easy on you. Oh, look, it's Areogonum inflatum. I can't believe this guy's still alive. Look at it. This tough bastard is blooming. I didn't even realize that. Look at it. He's blooming. You can see those tiny little flowers in there. You see those? Areogonum, uh, God, inflatum. Why am I almost, the heat's getting to me. I almost forgot the species. Areogonum inflatum, so called because it's got that hollow inflated stem, which is a, an adaptation for structure. Basically, you don't have to waste all that energy building cellulose in the inner tissue uh, if you, if you basically make it, uh, expand like that you widen it right there it just adds more structure so you can get this uh 
this flowering stalk, this flowering stem, uh, which is of course photosynthetic as you can see. You can get it up there, get it uh, acting like a big uh, beacon, a big lighthouse uh, to pollinators. And then of course, there's, I can't believe this thing is flying right now. So this is Ariaganum inflatum, but be careful, not every species of buckwheat that has this inflated stem is inflatum. Inflatum is a perennial. There's also Ariaganum fusiform in Utah, which looks a lot like this, but is a little bit greener and is an annual. Oh yeah, it's very unpleasant outside. One last thing, actually a couple. You can see these are just alluvial deposits, just, you know, basically uh, rock that's been deposited uh, mostly by water, I guess entirely by water over uh, the years. Uh, look, there's a bunch of rat shit right there too. Obviously the, the pack rats are living in there. Probably K rats, the kangaroo rats. So there's just alluvial deposits, mostly granite washed out of the surrounding mountains. This is a uh, Hyptus amorei. They changed the genus now. It's Condea amorei. Smells absolutely lovely. It's called Desert Lavender is the common name and it's in the Lamiaceae uh, family. Same family as oregano and mint. This bastard right here, Senegalia gregii, cat claw, acacia, real mean fuck as you can see by those uh, brutal claws on it. But, uh, and then of course it's in the pea family. This is in the mimosa subfamily of the pea family, which is a whole cluster fuck. They don't look anything like pea flowers. You know, they're those little fairy duster looking things. Interesting thing about this though is that it does get, it's a host to a very lovely smelling and interesting parasitic plant. Uh, uh, known as uh, desert mistletoe, uh, which I don't see any on here, but it's basically desert mistletoe is very red stems and extremely fragr uh, fragrant little white flowers. Uh, and it flowers mostly, I've seen it in January. Maybe it could flower in the spring too, but I've mostly seen it in January. Anyway, I'm going to go back to my truck before I die. Hope you enjoyed this. Have a nice day. Go fuck yourself. Uh, take it easy. Bye.